Welcome, you're watching Eye on Harvard, brought to you by In Time TV. I'm Ogan Gurel. We have a fabulous show today with a, a very prominent and uh, insightful guest, Dr. Professor, as well as uh, doctor, his PhD from Harvard, Stephen Kaplan. We're going to answer some very important, fascinating questions today. One is uh, about uh, venture capital entrepreneurship and private equity. We're going to talk about whether venture capitalists should bet on the jockey or the horse. We're going to talk about private equity, how the cycles, how that industry has changed, what's the outlook, obviously a very hot topic. And we'll talk about some of the balance between equity and debt and implications for the economy and uh, entrepreneurial finance and so forth. Professor Stephen Kaplan, it's a pleasure uh, to have him, a great honor. He's the Neubauer Professor of Entrepreneurship and Finance at the University of Chicago Graduate School of Business. He's one of the foremost researchers in the field of private equity, corporate governance, and venture capital in the world. His papers on LBOs, leverage buyouts, are the standard references in the field. He's testified to U.S. Senate, U.S. Uh, House committees about his research. Clearly very important uh, these days uh, with the economic turmoil that we've been seeing. Findings regularly appear in prominent business uh, journals. In fact, Business Week is named in one of the top ten, 12 business school teachers in the country. Professor Kaplan teaches advanced MBA executive management courses in entrepreneurial finance, private equity, corporate uh, financial management, corporate governance, and wealth management. He founded the Entrepreneurship Program at the Chicago Graduate School of Business in 1997, serves as the executive director of the GSP Polsky Center for Entrepreneurship. He's academic co-dean of the uh, Kaufman uh, Fellows Program for some of our investor uh, people in the audience, they may be aware that that's a very prominent educational program designed to educate and train future leaders in venture capital and high growth companies. Professor Kaplan serves on the boards of Accretive Health, of Columbia Acorn Funds, and Morningstar, the uh, investment research firm. He's also a director at the Illinois Venture Capital Association and the University of Chicago Laboratory Schools. Obviously, we're on the Eye on Harvard show. And he is a uh, extensive Harvard background with a Ph.D. Uh, in business economics as well as an A.B. summa cum laude uh, in applied mathematics and economics from Harvard College. Welcome, well, Professor Kaplan, Steve. Thank you, Ogan. Pleasure to have you. We, it's great to be here. We have some uh, really important topics. I've had a chance to read some of your papers uh, among, obviously, many of the uh, people in Congress and business leaders, uh, very important papers. And there's some very important questions. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd like to structure our discussion in uh, three parts. One is about venture capital, which is one of your areas of expertise. The other on private equity. And the third, if we have time, is the economy in general. Okay. Uh, venture capital uh, has a lot of interesting questions. One of them has been whether you bet on the jockey or the horse. Uh, if I might just clarify that, the jockey is the management team, the horse is the business idea. And there have been conflicting uh, consensus or conflicting ideas about that, and mm -hmm. you've written some papers actually recently coming out. Tell us a little bit about that controversy and what your research results show. So when you uh, look at startups and uh, talk to venture capitalists or talk to entrepreneurs, <clears throat> you get you know very different views. I think it's it's clear you want to invest in a in a great business idea, and you want to invest in people who can execute that idea. And, uh, you know, that's like obvious, right? But then, you know, you teach that or you tell people that and then they'd say, well, which is more important? You know, is it the management? Is it the, uh, the business? And, you know, then you'd go talk to people or I'd go talk to people and some people would say, it's management, management, management. Right. And other people would say, you know, I don't care about the management. I just want a great idea. And so that is a, you know, when you have something where there's a real difference of opinion and nobody, you know, and it's not obvious which, which matters more. It's a great place to do some research because it's an empirical question. And uh, that's what I did with a couple of my colleagues. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we went and looked at companies that had been very successful. So took companies that uh, had gone public. And it turned out we, f for, from another research project, had had very early business plans for 50 companies that ultimately went public. 
And some of these are household names, some of these you know, are not, but they, these were 50 companies that went public, you know, started from nothing basically when they had no revenues and went public. And what we did was we said, okay, what does this company look like at the business plan and what does it look like when it goes public? Because the, the view that it's management, 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 you'll often uh, hear people say, you know, an A management team starts with an idea and then shifts, you know, goes from here to here, figures out what works, and then it ends up being successful. In that context, and you can attribute to management. That's the jockey story or the right. management story. And the horse story would say, you know, great product, and, you know, you might not have the right management team. Get rid of them if that's the case, and then, you know, you'll succeed. And so we looked at this. So we, we had these 50 companies. And uh, we looked at the business that the company was started with and the business when it went public. And of those 50, one company had changed the business. One. Right. And we were, we were, we were just shocked because that's not the jockey story. That's, so, uh, that's the horse story. The hypothesis of the jockey story would have implied that more of those companies you would have changed. You should have seen more of them moving around. And on the other hand, you know, the CEOs of these companies, when they went public, roughly half of them were not founders. And so lots, of, and then if you look at the rest of the management team, there was also uh, lots of non-founders. So a huge amount of change in the management team, very little or no change in the business. And so we presented this paper in most of these companies were sort of dot-com you know, era companies, not all, but many of them. People said, no, it's, 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 it's the bubble, it's the dot-com era. If you looked at another sample, you, wouldn't, you right. wouldn't find this. So we looked at another sample. We looked at a later sample uh, of about 100 companies that went public in 2004 and found exactly the same thing. And that's so, your that's your latest paper. That's they're both in that paper. Right. So it's the it's the same paper, and you know what happens with research, often is you'll you know you'll you'll take a shot at it, mm -hmm. and uh, you present it to you know both other academics and practitioners. You get feedback, and then uh, if the feedback is uh, is good, or if the feedback you know, tells you you got it, you have to you should look at this uh, a little bit more carefully. Well, then you you know, run some other tests. And so we added this test to the paper and uh, got the same result. And once we had these two different samples that basically said the same thing, then the paper is more or less done. It'll come out in the Journal of Finance uh, either later this year or next year. And uh, it is a very, very strong finding. And then, you know, you think, look, at, look around the world at these companies. Um, Starbucks. Yes. You know, what is Starbucks doing? exactly what it was doing on day one right you look at ebay and starbucks has the same ceo now so that's yeah. you know it could be either but now let, let's take a look at ebay ebay what did ebay start doing ebay was started to like trade pens, pez dispensers or something like that and uh it's still doing exactly what it was started to do but with a different ceo Let's talk about that right after the break. The human capital aspect is very important. You're watching Eye on Harvard, Professor Steve Kaplan. Stay right there. Hi, I'm Michael Momando. You're watching the In Time TV Network, where professionals say big time connecting with their community worldwide. If you're in the restaurant or hospitality industry, I invite you to tune in to Restaurant Talk, where you can email or call in questions, comments, or concerns. You may even be a guest on our weekly Saturday show. To see a recent tasty episode of Restaurant Talk, please tune in to www.intimetv.com. When someone abducts a child, they're not about to advertise it, but we will. Sign up at wirelessamberalerts.org to get free Amber Alert text messages on your cell phone. Help put a child abductor out of business for good. Wireless Amber Alerts. A child is calling for help.
Welcome back. You're watching Eye on Harvard, brought to you by In Time TV. I'm Ogan Garel. Our guest, Professor Stephen Kaplan of the University of Chicago, Neubauer, Neubauer Professor of Entrepreneurship and uh, uh, Finance, one of the world's experts on venture capital. In fact, uh, we've answered one of the perennial, with your research, one of the perennial questions in venture capital, the jockey or the horse, whether it's management or... Uh, the idea that's more important. And I'll quote some quotes from your article mm -hmm. to kind of frame this. Uh, Arthur, uh, the, the Venture Capital Handbook, Gladstone, Gladstone 2002, stated, you can have a good idea and poor management and lose every time. You can have a poor idea and good management and win every time. Your research would seem to indicate otherwise. In more in agreement with Warren Buffett, who in his... Uh, very nice style, says, when a management team with a reputation for brilliance tackles a business with a reputation for bad economics, it is the reputation of the business that remains intact. Uh, <laughs> that's a fascinating comment. So Warren Buffett's comment, I think, uh, Warren your Buffett is, is right. It's very funny because we, you know, we wrote this paper, we presented it a few times, and then I, you know, one of my friends said, you know, I think Warren Buffett said something that was relevant for this. And then, you know, you go on the internet and you search it for up. it and there it was. So yeah, he got that absolutely right. Now, the thing, you know, you have to be careful about with this paper is that, you know, some people have said, well, are you saying management doesn't matter at all? Right. And, and that's going to be where we go next. And the answer is no, we're not saying management doesn't matter. I think the bottom line there is if you have a bad business and great management, you're toast. And if like you, Warren Buffett it, said, it's the reputation it's, of the bad business that stands. Ex exactly. But if you have a good business in bad management, you still may have a problem, but you have the opportunity to get rid of the bad management, put someone else in, and still succeed. And I've seen that a number of times. I had a former student, actually. She started a business, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a great idea, and it was in biotech, actually. Mm -hmm. and. Wrong CEO. You know, venture funded, the VCs put in the wrong CEO. Business sort of floundered for a little while. They got rid of the CEO who was bad. They put in a good CEO, and the company went public this year. So that leads to our next topic, which is CEO characteristics, mm -hmm. which you've uh, also written a seminal paper on. The title of this is Which CEO Characteristics and Abilities Matter? And I think it's very good that you made the caveat to your previous jockey versus uh, horse paper that management does matter, of course, mm -hmm. but perhaps not to the extreme degree as Goldman and Goldman would, would have venture Correct. capitalists believe. So this article on CEO characteristics and ability matter uh, is a long article. We can't certainly cover it, but I wanted to highlight a few topics. One was a theme which was very interesting where characteristics, they're the hard characteristics and the soft characteristics. The hard is aggressive, technical characteristics, and the soft are the team building, uh, collaborative aspects. Mm -hmm. and, and certainly, please correct me in, in uh, you know, how I characterize those. How does that debate resolve itself, the hard versus the soft in CEO characteristics? <clears throat> So uh, the bottom line is that the hard characteristics seem to uh, predict success more than the soft ones. And um, the, you know, be careful, hard, hard versus soft is, uh, let me explain what we mean yeah, by that do, in yeah. the paper. So th the soft characteristics would be things like you know, good listener, you know, respectful, you know, works well in teams. And the hard characteristics are not, you know, I'm a jerk, um, but, are ra but are rather, uh, you know, moves fast, gets things done, uh, is aggressive, and things that are, you know, you'd probably, you know, the best way to think about this is, you know, you might have Jack Welch on the hard side. I mean, he's not, uh, well, maybe I have to ask people what they Neutron think of him. But Neutron Jack. I mean, this guy's a guy who moves fast, is tough, um, but gets things done. Uh, and then you might have Jeff Immelt, who has this reputation for being a good listener, team player, mm -hmm. whatever. And I think that's, you know, how these characteristics sort of 
unfold. Now, you know, somebody who's here could very well be very good on those other characteristics, and maybe Jeff Immelt is. I don't know him. Right, and, right. and, you know, Jack Welch, I don't know whether he would have moved over there. But when you look at what correlates with how well companies do, it's these hard characteristics, moving fast, getting things done, as opposed to the soft things. And uh, that is, uh, it's interesting, because if you, you read the business press these days, there are some people say, oh, we must have CEOs now who are good listeners and collaborative and so on and so forth. At least, you know, for this sample, and the sample is there are companies that were funded by venture capitalists, companies that were funded by private equity investors, uh, it's the hard characteristics rather than the soft ones that are associated with success. Let's talk a little bit more about that, but I, I did want to reiterate what you just said about the popular business press indicating that we need more of the soft, in fact our culture and our society is evolving to appreciate those characteristics more. I think what's uh, very fascinating about your research is to the extent that some of your conclusions have been the opposite of sort of folk uh, consensus, if you will, the jockey versus the mm -hmm. horse. You take an objective, empirical approach to these questions and answer them from that perspective. Likewise, as you stated, people are saying, oh, we've got to have more of the soft, and your research shows that the hard is more correlated uh, with success. So tell us a little bit more what you mean by that in terms of success, how'd you measure that, and, and how'd you make that connection? So what we did, we were, I mean, uh, let me step back to sure. where this started. There is absolutely, I shouldn't say no, there's almost no empirical research on this topic as to what is associated with success, because the data are so hard to get. And you really want a situation where you can run a horse race, so I'm using the same yeah. analogy as the previous one, where you have information about CEOs when they start and then see how different characteristics are associated with subsequent success. So getting data on what a CEO is actually like is really hard because sure. you can't go interview them. Now, I was well, lucky... Let's uh, talk about that right after the break. Or Time flies uh, with you, Steve. But uh, you're watching Eye on Harvard, brought to you by In Time TV. Our guest, Professor Steve Kaplan. Fascinating topic. Stay right there. Go right back. No matter where you live, Life in the oceans depends on you. To keep our oceans clean, recycle and dispose of trash properly. To learn what you can do, go to keepoceansclean.org. Once they've outgrown their toddler seat, they're still not ready for adult safety belts alone. Four foot nine is the magic number. Until then, kids need a booster seat. Make sure your little pumpkin gets there safely. Visit BoosterSeat.gov. Welcome back. You're watching Ion Harvard. Our guest, Professor Stephen Kaplan, the Neubauer Professor of Entrepreneurship and Finance at the University of Chicago Graduate School of Business. Fascinating topics today. We were uh, just talking about CEO characteristics, mm -hmm. and we had talked a little bit about the hard versus the soft, and you were kind of setting the background to the extent of the empirical basis of the study and, mm -hmm. and the background behind the paper. So there's basically very little... Uh, work on this. Good to great is probably the the one that people uh, mm. have heard of and, and it's probably as good as anything out there and uh, what Jim Collins did there is he looked after the fact at who was successful and said these CEOs had these characteristics who were very successful but what you don't know when you read that book is 
maybe there were 50 CEOs who had the same characteristics who were miserable failures. Mm. And all you see were the, the 10 or 15 who were successful. And so you can't say... So from a scientific you, perspective, you, there wasn't a control. Exactly. You just, right. you can't, you, you know, you can say, gee, that's really interesting. And the book is really interesting. But you can't say for sure these are the characteristics right. that matter. So we uh, hooked up and we're fortunate to hook up with a, a firm that interviews CEO candidates. It's a company called GH Smart. And uh, that's because... Uh, the founder's name is Jeff Smart. Uh, he is smart, but it's, uh, it's his name. And uh, he, he wanted to know whether they were making the right decisions because they had a methodology. They, what they would do is they're hired by the private equity investors or venture capital investors to assess a CEO candidate that they're thinking of investing in. And uh, they have a you know, structured process. It's a four-hour interview. And at the end, they come up with a 30 or 40 page report where they assess this candidate on like more than 40 different dimensions. And so they had done this. They thought, you know, we know what we're doing, but we want to learn, you know, are there things we're missing? Are there? And uh, so they uh, partnered with us and uh, basically Jeff gave us, gave us all these interviews, 300, 400 interviews. It's a gold mine. And sets gold mine says, you know, tell us what's in there. And uh, that's what we ended up doing. And this might be an obvious question, but I think it's important. So how did you measure the success? What, what are the uh, so endpoints, if you will? So the success we was tricky because some of these companies were private, yeah. and some of them are still private rather than publicly traded companies. Uh, what we first did is we went to the investors. We called up the investors or emailed them or whatever and said, uh, was this, well, first of all, did you hire this person who you interviewed? Mm -hmm. And then second of all, if you hired him or her and made the investment, was the CEO, you know, did he or she do a good job? And I think we had, you know, this was great, okay, mm -hmm. lousy. Uh, and then also, you know, did you make money? Yeah. Did you make a lot of money, a little money? Did you lose money? And that's basically how we measured performance. So it's not, it's not as precise as you might be able to do for a public company where you can actually measure the returns on a lot of companies, sure. but it's, it's probably, you know, for this purposes, if they said this was a great CEO and a great investment, it's quite different if they said this person was a failure. Now, one of the topics uh, that was mentioned, but not explicitly developed, but I'd like to explore is the difference between thinker and doer. Okay. What is your perspective from the work that you've done in this area that's been an area of controversy for executives? Yeah, in the in the paper there you know what we find uh and this is more on the the private equity side which is existing businesses. We we had a measure, you know, we tried to get a measure of you know whether it was thinking or whether it was, you know, SAT scores or something like that uh, and then we have these other measures of you know do you get things done and in for the private equity investments which would be you know existing companies the the doers I think did better the uh, there wasn't once you were above a certain level in terms of IQ or mm -hmm. SAT scores it, it didn't matter on the margin sure. uh, whether it was any higher um, on the VC side it might have mattered a little bit more. So on the venture capital investments, which are probably more technology related, I think there was a relationship, and I'm not, I'd have to go back to the paper to, to check exactly. But you would seem to imply that that, that thinker-doer dichotomy shifts in importance it, as the it, company it, matures. It, it, it might very well. And uh, certainly for companies that are the more mature companies, it, it looked like from that that the, the doers was what you wanted to focus on. Now, the thinkers weren't negative, right? Yeah, Being right. smarter wasn't a negative, but it didn't seem to matter as much as getting stuff done, which, again, is sort of what I come out with when I, when I think about uh, this paper. If you've ever been in a meeting and you, know, you may have a, a boss or the person leading the meeting who's really smart, 
but if he or she never does anything, mm -hmm. you get incredibly frustrated. And the people and the people get the most frustrated are probably the most effective people. Right. And I, you know, if I had to guess what, where those results come from, that's where those results come from. Another important thing that you touch upon in the CO Characteristics Abilities Matter paper um, is that coming out in Journal of Corporate Finance? This, this we are still in the process of getting feedback okay. and revising and then we'll then uh, send off to a journal. Right. But one of the themes that you've explored is the, the notion of the insider, also known mm -hmm. as the incumbent, versus the outsider. Mm -hmm. And as many are aware, private equity firms build management teams and the question is whether they should take insiders or outsiders. Big area of contention, big area of controversy. It looks like you have some definitive results in this regard. So what we, we find there is that in terms of whether you're hired or not, there's a big advantage to being an insider. So you can have somebody who's a much more talented outsider versus a, a less talented insider and the insider will get hired in a lot of cases even though there's a more talented person outside. Now the story would be well you know the insider has all these relationships he has all this you know knowledge about his or her company and that offsets maybe they're not as talented on other dimensions. Now if that's the case when you look at how they perform uh, an insider and an outsider of equal talent the well, we'll come back the to that. The outsider seems to do better. Well, the outsider, based on this, the insider should do better, but he doesn't. We'll talk about that some more right after the break. You're watching Eye on Harvard. I'm Ogan Garel. Our guest, Professor Stephen Kaplan. Stay right there. We're going to answer a lot more questions right after the break. Today, we're moving faster than ever before. Even your ideal prospect will see your ad, click to your website, then decide to read on or read none in a mere one to seven seconds. After that, you become invisible. So what's the answer? How do you capture and hold the attention of your target audience? In Time TV. The In Time TV network broadcasts industry-specific TV shows to the people who buy your products, surgeons, primary care physicians, dentists, podiatrists, chiropractors, hospital administrators can now watch live in-time programs on widescreen, on their PC or laptop while checking email. Shows can even be viewed on a cell phone during a train commute. In-time TV is peer-to-peer -peer TV that covers the hot topics in industries that you sell to. In-time TV shows are broadcast worldwide via the internet Yet the cost of running a 60-second commercial is a fraction of what you'd pay for a display ad in a trade magazine. In Time TV is what your target audience is watching. Keeping professionals engaged worldwide. Mom? Dad? How long should I wait for you? If I'm at soccer practice. What if something happens? Will you come get me? There's no reason not to have a plan in case of an emergency. Should we go to the neighbor's house? And some extremely good reasons why you should. Can you tell me? Talk to your family about what you would do in case of an emergency. Welcome back. You're watching Eye on Harvard, brought to you by InTime TV. I'm Ogan Garel. Our guest, Professor Stephen Kaplan, uh, Neubauer Professor of Entrepreneurship and Finance at the University of Chicago Graduate School of Business. If you're just joining us, you missed a lot of interesting discussions, but welcome. Just wanted to read a couple things about Professor Kaplan. He's one of the foremost researchers in the world of private equity, which we're going to talk about shortly. Corporate governance, which we are talking about now. Uh, in terms of CEO characteristics and venture capital, which we talked about earlier. So uh, uh, his work is very far-ranging, but we've uh, been fortunate enough to cover some of that uh, today. 
his papers on LBOs, which we'll talk about shortly, are the standard references in the field, and he has testified to U.S. Senate and U.S. House committees about his research, so really pr privileged to have him. So just before the break, we're talking about CEO characteristics, mm -hmm. outsiders versus insiders. Tell us your conclusions about that. So <clears throat> when you look at who these firms hire, you know, whether it's venture capital funded companies or private equity funded companies, uh, they place an advantage on insiders, meaning that if you have two people of equal talent, they will hire the insider. Even if you have an outsider who's more talented than the insider, they may very well hire the insider uh, because probably because they think there's some advantage to being an insider. Now, when you then look at how these people perform, you would think that, again, an insider, an outsider of equal talent, the insider should perform better. And what you find is actually no, mm -hmm. that there's no difference in performance from equally talented insiders and outsiders. And what that says is you should just hire talent. And that, that there's not, at least in, in this data, we don't see any advantage to being an insider. And so if you're given this choice, talented outsider, so-so insider, hire the talented outsider. And that would imply then, by corollary, that the, the insider benefit, perceived insider benefit, is actually not there. It's not in our data. That is correct. Very interesting. Well, let's uh, shift gears to private equity. We've touched upon that. Okay. Uh, and one of the reasons I re reiterated uh, parts of your bio is uh, your, your papers on LBOs are among the standard references in mm -hmm. the field. And in fact, uh, there's a very important paper, Leverage Buyouts in Private Equity. I want to discuss some of the results from there. But first, uh, since our audience is a general audience, tell us the definition of private equity. What, what is your... Uh, so private equity has you know a few meanings but I'll, I'll t in the United States private there's private equity and venture capital which are both uh, types of investments in companies that are not publicly traded and and that's really the the distinction between private equity and public equity so what does that mean well venture capital tends to be investments in small startups they're innovative companies they may not have any revenues or they're you know very new private equity would be investments in companies that are more mature but are either not publicly traded when you make the investment or you might buy a publicly traded company and take it private so you know in the last year or two Toys R Us was taken private Hospital Corporation of America was taken private. Uh, Texas Utilities uh, is a very large deal is being taken private. And in a going private transaction, uh, which are sometimes called leverage buyouts, uh, and those are both, you know, you can also call that a private equity transaction. And that's a subset of private equity to the extent that you use debt. LBOs would be part of private equity, correct, because you're taking, you're using leverage to take a company private. And what happens in a leverage buyout is, let's say uh, a company is uh, worth a billion dollars. Uh, and it's, you know, the stock is worth a sure. billion dollars and it has no debt at the time. What you would do in a, a leverage buyout is you would borrow $700, $800 million. Then you would take $200 or $300 million of private equity, and you would buy the company from the public shareholders and take the company private. And now you, as the private equity investor, with your $200 or $300 million equity investment, control the company. And the banks or... Uh, institutional investors have provided you with the 700 or 800 million dollars of debt which you have to repay over time. So that's uh, basically the anatomy if you will of a private equity in particular buyout transaction. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of controversy and, and your paper addresses some of this whether that's a good model for mm -hmm. economic value and some of the virtues being uh, the pressure of the leverage, the, the pressure of the debt, uh, creating more focus on cash flow, etc., uh, improved concentrated management. Uh, 
tell us a little bit about uh, your insights into whether this is really a value to the economy. So the there is a, a real debate uh, out there as to whether these transactions do anything good. Yeah. Right. You know, somebody says, "Oh, it's just you know putting leverage. We're you know firing everybody, uh, and then somehow it's worth more, and then you know the private equity investors make a lot of money." Um, that would be the negative view. Uh, the positive view would be that when these firms buy the companies, they do a few things. Uh, the first thing they do is they give management more of the upside. They also give them more of the downside. They give them more of the upside, meaning that management you know, might get uh, all told 10 or 20 percent of the upside of the company. Uh, which is a lot more than they would get running a public company and uh, will attract better managers and will also make those managers, encourage those managers to make better decisions. Uh, number two, uh, you behave differently when you've got a mortgage to repay, as long as it's repayable, right. uh, than when you have no mortgage. Right? You're much more careful with costs. Mm -hmm. um, when you've got a mortgage then when you don't. And the third thing that has been true in the last five or ten years is the private equity firms uh, have brought on capabilities to help the companies think about ways to improve. So a lot of the private equity firms have taken on uh, CEOs or consultants or people who have real industry expertise and can actually help the companies make changes. So that's the positive side. And, and again, you've got the positive side, you've got the negative, and it's an empirical question as to what really happens. And so what I do in that paper and have done in, in I've done some of the research. What I do in that paper is I you know, talk about my research and talk about the research of others is you know, what happens. Yeah. And it turns out that in, you look at samples in the 1980s, you look at samples in the 1990s, you look in the U.S., you look in Europe, uh, there is, I don't know that there's one paper that gets the negative result, meaning all of the research finds that these companies are more profitable uh, and uh, you know, the extent you can measure it more valuable mm -hmm. after the buyout than they were before. Well, very interesting conclusion. So basically you say that uh, by and large private equity has been a positive. Absolutely. You're watching In Time TV's Eye on Harvard. Send us an email at ask at intimetv.com, ask at intimetv.com about this question. just one too many. Buzz driving is drunk driving. Hey guys, thanks for coming. Are we in trouble? No, you're not in trouble. I just uh, want to set some ground rules. Like, like what? Well, remember last week when you hit Vinny in the head with the shovel? <laughs> I do not recall that. <laughs> of course not. Well, it was pretty graphic. Too graphic for the kids. <laughs> so I'm going to have to block you. I, you know, I got to make this up to you. This is Vinny's watch, and I want you to have it. You deserve no, it. Thank you. That's really not necessary. No, no. Come here. Welcome back. You're watching Eye on Harvard, brought to you by In Time TV. We're here with Professor Stephen Kaplan, the Neubauer Professor of Entrepreneurship and finance at the University of Chicago Graduate School of Business. Just before the break, we uh, answered a very important question that uh, uh, has been addressed in this paper, Leveraged Buyouts and Private Equity, whether private equity has been good for the economy. I think uh, from the medical side, we, we would call that uh, meta-analysis. Mm -hmm. You did your own empirical research, plus you combined other research, and the meta-analysis plus your own research would seem to indicate 
that uh, there's been no essentially negative findings relative to private equity and the economy that they've increased value, etc. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've sent out the, the request to send your emails to ask at intimetv.com for any perspectives. But it looks like you've talked about this subject, obviously, and there's uh, a lot of controversy. It's a lot of controversy. I had a conversation with a, a reporter at a big national newspaper, and you know, I told them this. I said, you know, the research is pretty uniform. Cash flows go up. Value increases. Uh, and he uh, was... I don't know if shocked is the right word, but he said, you know, nobody in my newsroom would have thought that. And so there... I guess this is not the Wall Street Journal. It would not be the... Well, you never... You Wall, never Street, Wall Street Journal has, you know... Is their own I ideas. think there's some very... You know, there are difference of opinions at exactly. uh, most uh, papers. Um, and uh, there is also, I think, the, the view which the unions have... Uh, promoted that, you know, there's this huge amount of job loss. And uh, the facts there, you know, facts there are a little more nuanced in that the, if you look at all these studies, what they typically find is that employment goes up on average, but goes up by less than other companies in the same industry. Sure. And uh, so it's not the story that you know, everybody's fired. It's also not the story that, you know, we're, you know, hiring loads of people and growing faster than everybody else. It's, it's more or less what you'd expect. Private equity goes, for, goes in, private equity firm goes in and runs the company more efficiently. It's exactly what you would expect As a result of this alignment of incentives, the operational engineering. Correct. And, um, and the pressure and the of pressure having to, of to debt, pay a mortgage. Exactly, which Absolutely. I guess we call financial call it financial engineering. Exactly. Yeah, so you have incentive engineering, you have financial engineering, you have operational engineering, and all three of those forces uh, play a role in getting the company or having the company uh, run more efficiently. Well, I think this is a very important point, and, and I like to go beyond the polemics to some extent, to the extent that, as you mentioned, there's, there was this newsroom that said no one would agree with you, and despite the empirical evidence, but I do think that this is important. No one, no one would have believed it. Believe I don't, it. Yeah, now, I you know, maybe they agree. Who maybe knows? they agree, yeah. Convincing article. But I guess what I'd like to explore is this really is a very fundamental, almost macroeconomic issue, not just microeconomic issue. And what is the best structure of investment and management that creates values for firms and economies? In other words, with the commercial revolution, you know, we had... Uh, the firm arise, we had stock markets, etc. And this is a debate between public companies where we have these centralized investors and private companies which are a lot more centralized investors and, and management. Um, I don't know if that an the question has been answered. How do you think that that debate is going? So I think the it's, it's a very good question and those are important questions. I think what what you have seen uh, over the last 30 years is you started uh, at a time, say 1980, where managers or CEOs of public companies owned very little stock, had very low incentives really to uh, do the right thing or run the company uh, effectively or, or at least care about their stock price. Uh, you didn't have much private equity at all. Mm -hmm. And the 80s really changed that. That's when you had the first Raiders. That's when you had the first uh, private equity the wave. Uh, well, <laughs> he's a fictional <laughs> character. Fictional, but but yeah. that's, that's, yeah, when, yeah. that's when Carl Icahn and yeah. Boone Pickens, you know, became famous. And, and very uh, famous speech that Gordon Gecko in Wall Street does uh, before, I think it's international paper. Oh, he's like, the greed is good. Uh, the greed is good, but you have the whole alignment of the vice presidents. They're all salaried, and he, he says, you're not, you don't really care about the stock price. Right, and this is the, the you know, the phrase that, uh, you know, that I sometimes use is, if you pay peanuts, you will get monkeys. <laughs> um, it would be, you know, the same thing. And uh, that has changed. Right. And that's changed for public companies. It, I think part of the reason it changed was because of the private equity and leverage buyout investors who discovered it actually makes sense to align interests. And so that first wave in the 80s, I think, was about, we discovered, 
alignment of interests actually matters. Yes. And the public companies copied it. And now public company CEOs uh, have more pay for performance. And this is another thing that is sort of not well understood because you have, um, I think, misreporting in some cases mm -hmm. that uh, public company CEOs are not paid for performance. It's like completely wrong. Mm -hmm. There's a huge amount of pay for performance. And there are a few cases where it's not, and those tend to get publicity. Um, so you have a situation where I think the the public companies are in better shape than they were 20 or 30 years ago and the private equity firms innovated and what they now do on top of the financial engineering uh, with the incentives and the leverage is the operational piece where they are also bringing sort of innovative ways to make the companies better and uh, doing the deal so the I'm not sure I answered your question, other than to say I think things, people have innovated, the private equity firms have innovated, the public companies have innovated. We are much better off, companies are much better run on average today than 25 or 30 years ago, but you would never know it if you read the business press every day. Right. Well, I think uh, that certainly does answer the question to some extent because you reframe the question in a certain sense to a certain extent. I've presented a dichotomous situation mm -hmm. between private and public and what you've basically said is that they cross fertilize each other. I think that's right. What has happened in the 80s and we'll talk about how private equity has evolved uh, changed the nature of public enterprises. Mm -hmm. We're going to take a short break here. Uh, right after the break we'll talk about trends in private equity and the outlook for the future. You're watching Eye on Harvard. I'm Ogan Gurel. Our guest, Professor Stephen Kaplan. Stay right there. We have some more interesting questions to answer coming right up. Any questions? No. You know. We're not magicians. We can't read your mind. We your mind. Your questions, each and every kind. What are the side effects? done this before. Welcome back. You're watching Eye on Harvard. I'm Ogan Gurel. Our guest, Professor Steve Kaplan, Newbauer Professor of Entrepreneurship and Finance at the University of Chicago Graduate School of Business. We've had a fantastic interview. I've certainly learned a lot and uh, really appreciate your time. We have a few more minutes. You've testified before U.S. Senate, U.S. Congress, so we're really very privileged to have you. And in fact, some of the t questions I wanted to ask I think are of a more general nature. We've seen uh, in uh, not that we haven't touched on general topics, of course, but we've seen the private equity boom and what looks like now a bust of sorts, and I'm, I'm generalizing, of course. But we've seen three cycles, which I've read in your papers. The 1980s, mm -hmm. uh, T. Boone Pickens, etc. cetera. Uh, then the 1990s, which peaked in 1998. And then the present boom cycle, if you will, that's peaked uh, around last year. Um, how have those cycles changed, and what is the outlook for the future for private equity? So you're absolutely right in that this is a very cyclical business, which is, is very interesting because yeah. you have on, on the one hand the things we talked about where the private equity firms do some things that seem to be very sensible, the financial engineering, the incentives, the mm -hmm. operational engineering. and. You know, you can call that a secular trend where, you know, there's been kind of a, an upward movement over time. Now, around that 
upward movement, you have these cycles. And, you know, it was a big cycle in the late 80s, culminated with the RJR Nabisco mm -hmm. leverage buyout, uh, which, you know, was all over the papers in, uh, you know, 1988, 89. Uh, and then, you know, the second, you know, the 90s wave was, was a modest one. It was there, but it was, it was not quite the same. And then what we just went through, where you had this huge wave, and which appears to have just ended uh, with the, the credit turmoil uh, that showed up this summer. And what seems to happen is there are periods where earnings get high relative to interest rates. And, you know, for whatever reason, in the late 80s, earnings relative to what you could buy them for on the stock market were high relative to interest rates. And what did the private equity firms do. They borrowed a lot of money, mm -hmm. bought the companies, and had enough earnings to make the interest payments. That's exactly what happened in 2005, 06, and the first half of 07, that for whatever reason, and this is the thing that is hard to understand, lenders were very generous. So in the late 80s, it was the junk bond investors, mm -hmm. and that's when Michael Milken mm -hmm. uh, was in his prime. Um, were overly, and, and I think it turns out, overly generous in the late 80s. And what happened in the last couple years is it was the, uh, the investors in the what are called the term loans, which is basically the, the main loan or the main mortgage, if you will, those lenders were very generous. They were lending at relatively low spreads over um, a riskless kind of rate and had very few covenants or requirements on those loans at the same time. And what the private equity industry saw was, gee, I can borrow a lot of money. I have enough to buy the stock. And when I do that, my earnings are high enough to make the interest payments you know, that's, no that's not hard to figure out. Yeah. And that's why you saw those deals get done. Now, what's happened since is the spreads have gone way up. So there was just a, you know, just sort of a shift. It's shock. Yeah. All of a sudden, one day it was 2.5% spread. Today it's like 5 or 6% spread. You can't, now if you borrow, first of all, you can't borrow. But even if you could, you wouldn't have enough earnings to make the interest payments, and so activity goes down. It looks like earnings have flattened out. And earnings may have fallen, although it's the ratio of earnings and yeah. prices. Prices have gone down, earnings have gone down, and so that's probably stayed about the same. Well, I know you're uh, one of the world's leading microeconomists, but uh, maybe I can pose a macroeconomic question. We have all this uncertainty in the economy. What is, uh, what is your outlook? Yeah, this is, uh, you know, I, I do get asked this, even though I, I plead ignorance. Uh, and sometimes I have, you know, a clear view it's going to go one way or go another. And, you know, at least looking uh, at the situation and talking to, to very smart people, there is a big difference of opinion out there, and uh, which says there's a huge amount of uncertainty. And that's actually an answer. And uh, to some that, that's to some extent, uncertainty feeds into higher interest rates, et cetera. Or? And I think it, the, the thing that, that I think you worry about is that people don't make decisions, going back to the first paper, and it freezes people, and that reduces investment, and that leads to a slowdown. So that's the, uh, the negative story. The other thing that, that's a risk is that uh, the credit markets, which are have tightened up, and so there there's less money out there uh, for loans or less money to use to make investments. That that stays frozen, uh, and that'll be contractionary. Mm. Uh, and on the other hand, um, you know, if that if those risks are overblown, and people will discover this in the next few months, then you know we'll will come out of this okay. And I, I just, I really don't have a, uh, a clear idea of which way it will go. Well, that's an answer of sorts. Mm -hmm. uh, we only have a few seconds, a minute and a half to go. One of the advantages of In Time TV is we have an hour to talk with uh, leading thinkers and doers like yourself. 
So, but I wanted to throw a few questions at you, which will demand, you know, sound bites, as it were. But I, ready to, uh, I ready think to it's go. A good way to close. So, if you're an entrepreneur, you have a great idea. What's your advice? On the margin, make sure that idea is good, and then go do it. And if you're an investor, on the margin, where do you put your resources? Make sure the business is a good idea. Now, if you invest it or you do it as the entrepreneur or as the investor, once you've done it, great idea. Don't mess it up. So, if but potentially change the management. If the entrepreneur, you know, if you're the entrepreneur, you know, be open to bringing somebody else in. And if you're the venture capitalist, you know, VCs will tell you you can never fire a bad CEO too quickly. <laughs> and the last question: What would be your advice to the next president? Next president, I'll you know I'll give you the University of Chicago awesome. answer. You know, trust markets. Well, thanks a lot, Steve. Great. Uh, Thank you for having on. you. You're watching Eye on Harvard. We have some great guests coming up: Michael Alter, John Hibblefar, Bud Broda, Professor Gardner, Jim Doyle, Benjamin Frommer. Stay right there. We'll see you next week.